but thank you for that. Um, so yes, I am indeed Shell Banks. I am an IBCLC. I think it's one of the qualifications is that you actually can say that acronym. Um, otherwise, you're not allowed to be one. So I'm here today to talk about uh, having effective antenatal infant feeding conversations. It's it's so tricky. We You might be really well versed in what you should be saying to people, but actually it's very difficult to have those conversations with families. So that's what we're going to unpick a little bit today. A um, bit about me, as you say, um, I'm a, a lactation consultant. I do have a private practice, but it's so small as to be um, unnoticeable. I haven't actually had any private clients this month at all. Um, I am a baby friendly lead in a hospital and I um, work across neonatal and health visiting as well. And I've been working on baby friendly since 2007. So I'm fairly well um first in what's required there. And as you say, I'm a clinical director for Anya. Um, I'm also a mother of four. Um, I've been pregnant, actually been pregnant many more times than four. Um, but I've had those discussions with infant feeding people or actually just midwives at, at you know, normal standard midwives in my antenatal care. Um, I've I've breastfed my own kids and it's why I became a breastfeeding peer supporter in 2002. And as you say, I've served on some nice guidelines because when I know stuff and I can see stuff isn't quite right, I'm, I'm the sort of person who likes to stick my beak in and um, get involved and, uh, and to put my two penneth in. So um, hopefully... I did okay with those. As you say, I've also um, got a book out about formula feeding, which I thought it was really important to do. It took me a very long time to write it, to get it just right. And um, I've also started my PhD, which is also in um, infant feeding related. It's about unsettled babies. And I'm sure I'll be sharing that all over my socials. Feel free to follow me wherever you find me. So um, I thought I'd start with what even are effective antenatal infant feeding conversations? You know, what aren't they? What they're, they're not, oh my goodness, breast is best because that's not going to work. Um, if you're talking to somebody who agrees with you, with that sentiment, they're just going to agree with you. If you're talking to somebody who has never considered infant feeding or how they might feed their baby, and let's be honest, we know that most people who you talk to in their first pregnancy are thinking, oh my goodness, this thing is getting bigger all the time and it's going to have to come out. And I've seen stuff and I've watched, you know, Call the Midwife or One Born Every Minute or any number of dramatizations in which there's screaming and agony and blood and terror. And, and all they're thinking is 10 centimetres is like... Um, and so feeding is not the number one thing. They are thinking, how's this thing going to get out? Um, is the baby okay? And also, how is how are we going to actually deliver a baby? It's only the first maybe couple of days and perhaps buying things for the baby that most people have considered. Certainly, most people when they're having a baby don't, you know, well, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> I was 30. I thought I knew what it was going to be like. I hadn't got a clue. I remember being driven away from the hospital, chit-chatting away. And the, the baby in the back made a noise. And we looked at each other and said, oh, my goodness, do you think they realize we haven't got a clue what we're doing? And they've let us go home with this baby. And we were proper grown ups, you know, mortgages and businesses and, and, you know, in our 30s and 40s at that time. So there's a lot of stuff that they need to have communicated to them. Um, and the midwife who sees them during that antenatal time or the health visitor or whoever else from the team or if they're lucky enough to attend um, a, an infant feeding class there are so many messages you know there's lots of pregnancy health messages lots of prevention messages lots of safety messages and then there's all the stuff that we sort of feel is kind of bolted on at the end you know the the relationship building and the infant feeding stuff the stuff about um prevention and um safety and um stuff kind of you know these things about whether breastfeeding is a good idea or whether they've only only ever thought about formula feeding they need to have enough information to make informed choices 
and they need to have enough informa um, information about feeding. And, you know, we can we always can start with caring for and bonding because that's an easier conversation to have. But I've I've never, ever met anyone who's had enough information antenatally just from having their normal routine care to make decisions themselves, good informed decisions about infant feeding. It's very difficult to prepare people adequately. What we can do is get them to actually be making informed choices about everything. And that encourages them to go off and look for information themselves and to look for um, how, how they might build one and what they, what they need to know themselves. So there's this, which the lovely Amy Brown, um, she, I emailed her and said, or messaged her and said, uh, what do I need to say then? And she said, ah, yeah, you need to look at this. Um, so this is what do women really want? <laughs> Lessons for breastfeeding promotion and education. So I picked this out, which was key themes included a move away from the perception that breastfeeding is best rather than normal. I, I love to reframe it and think about our biological norm and any deviation from the biological norm coming with consequences. And I often talk about, um, so as to not make that judgment judgmental when we're talking about breastfeeding or not, I often say, you know, having your ears pierced is a, is a deviation from the biological norm. Personally, I love a dangly earring. I like the feeling. I think, I think it makes my face look pretty, goes with my glasses, you know. Um, I like an earring, but every one of us knows someone who's had an earring pulled out or it's gone gammy or something. Every deviation from the biological norm comes with consequences. Driving in the car. It's, you, you can't have a car accident if you aren't in a car. So every deviation from the biological norm comes with consequences. Antibiotics are a deviation from the biological norm. But if I've got sepsis, please give me all of the antibiotics because I don't want to die of sepsis. So some devi they come with consequences, but sometimes the consequences are beneficial. So talking about biological norms, talking about things other than the health benefits, because the health benefits only fit if that family is susceptible to or worried about the health benefit that we're, that we're banging on about. And actually, um, as it says, a message to every feed rather than just six months exclusive, people have got in their mind, actually lots of people have got in their mind that just the first feed is enough. Um, I think Amy's hit it on the, on the head here when she says targeting everybody, it's a wider society problem. So what I'm saying is I, I get that this is hard. <laughs> there, are, there are some issues. Um, what makes the conversation effective or ineffective? They need to trust the person they're having this conversation with. There's no point in you saying, hello, I've never met you before, but I've got to give you a lecture about um, infant feeding now because I've got a list to tick off and I need to tell you about benefits um, and dram that home and make sure that you've understood all of the messages I need to tell you. You know, we know we know that um, pregnant and uh, newly delivered parents are, are right brained focused. They're not left brain logical sequential like us they're they're a bit more fluffy and they need things to be um presented in a way where it slots onto information they've already got builds on existing um knowledge and is really light on any new information so you've got these opportunities across many different um ant antenatal appointments and to share that load between everybody who's seeing this mother and to drip feed information at different points so that's that's what I'm going to bang on about. Um, it's important because there is a wealth of evidence that breastfeeding is a massive public health imperative. As it says, if a new vaccine was available that could prevent one million or more child deaths a year and it was cheap, safe, administered orally and required no cold chain, it would become an immediate public health imperative. And, you know, that's 1994. Why did we not already sit up and take notice in 1994? It's such a slow burn. And I know you've already um, talked about the Lancet, um, I'm sure, briefly when we had the new one, new Lancet report out last month, but I'm going to touch on it again today. So we had originally this 
2016 report, um, the the Lancet breastfeeding series, and it had huge amounts of up to date, robust, evidence based, you know, really research data focused looks at breastfeeding, having breastfed babies, having fewer infections and, you know, protection against overweight and so on and so on, really in depth. And I spoke to one of the authors at a conference and um, he was super enthusiastic about it. And obviously there's a lot of work had gone into it. And, um, and it was, it was about two years after it had happened. And he said, what I can't understand is we've published this and yet it doesn't seem to have changed anything. Like he thought, well, if we build it, you know, if we tell everybody this news, the problem must be that people don't understand that breastfeeding is a good idea. And of course, that's not the problem at all, because people do understand, you know, these are some of the images that came out in in 2016, you know, big, bold, um, big, bold messages uh, as another one here could save more than 820,000 lives a year. Um, I think in the UK, this was dismissed a little bit because it was kind of all well, those are those are, you know, developing world babies. Those are babies who haven't got access to clean water. Well, you know, that's not quite what the evidence said, but obviously we have, you know, much better um, mortality rates here. And so it, it's not as big a, a, a threat to most babies. However, we've got big health inequities in this country, big, 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 um, meaning the difference between a baby who is born in one postcode and another baby born in another postcode based on things like family income and ethnicity and the age of the parents and the mental health of the parents and the physical health of the parents and what access there are to services and we talk about this postcode lottery but there is nothing you know there is nothing more crucial than those formative days weeks months of an infant's life because that's lifelong stuff being laid down and the impact of health inequities on our babies can't be underestimated. And we know that, you know, I just pulled something from the Marmot Review here. Um, and again, it's 13 years since this was published, but the data stands. Babies who aren't breastfed are at increased risk of, di of diarrhea and vomiting, ear and respiratory infections, cognitive delay, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. And then Mothers are least likely to breastfeed if they are poor, if they are in the lower two socioeconomic centiles, 20% um, less likely than the most affluent mothers. And if they're under 20, they are one third less likely than mothers over the age of 34. So we have all this information and it's been out for years and we broadcast it and we share it. And, you know, most trusts are now doing baby friendly. Most universities are now doing baby friendly. Most of us know this information, have been given this information, but it's still really difficult to get these messages across. So why is it so difficult? Um, it's difficult because these are the images, you know, lovely little um, mobile for a baby with a bottle on it, you know, the baby doll that the, baby, the little girl's got. From the moment we're tiny kids, breasts are used for selling things and babies are fed with bottles. And um, that's really hard to get past because that's our culture. And so our culture experiences have led to actually us having the pretty much the lowest breastfeeding rates in the world. And then if you add in the idea that a midwife or a health visitor or some other health professional might be the one saying, well, you know, you should be losing weight, eating properly, getting plenty of exercise, um, cutting, you know, stopping smoking, uh, getting away from that difficult relationship that you're in, um, buying the right things for your baby, and you should be breastfeeding and, 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 and. Most of us have a bit of a mistrust of authority figures purely because we went to school, we've been in the world and we start to kind of go, yeah, but I can make my own choices. I know better. So we can only counter these things where authority figures tend to undermine themselves with with these techniques like motivational interviewing. 
Um, there is, I haven't for some reason put the uh, link at the bottom of this one, but anyway, the link is in my references. Um, and so that is more about rather than telling them things, you follow what they say, you direct the conversation and you guide them into reaching a conclusion that is um, a, a better decision for them, a, a more informed choice. So it's asking them questions and listening to what they've said before informing them. There is no point in just going in with information because you know, I don't listen either sometimes. So why would we when we're being bombarded with advice and recommendations? Um, <laughs> then we have the, the Learn Sit 2023. And again, you know, they're very excited about it. It's going to change the world. They've gone a completely different way this time. They're not talking about the benefits of breastfeeding. They kind of gone, we've done that. Actually, this is about the exploitation of the commercial milk formula industry um, of our vulnerable families. And we should all be quite angry about that, actually, because we're spending loads of time and energy trying to get Im trying to get messages across to people. I'm furious, hence the book. Um, I want families to have good information about formula, and that should not come from the people who are selling the formula. That needs to come from independent and trustworthy sources. So advertising marketing all of the little ripples in a pond that are done by these companies and we have a collective responsibility um so i'm just gonna you know give you some examples of how shocking it is um first of all it's almost always beautiful looking white families so maybe that doesn't fit everybody's um need for their imagery um they almost always have beautiful soft focus and all beautifully written and um, you know, make wild claims about things. And um, then even more shocking is the stuff on the right hand side, because the stuff aimed at health professionals, which if you ever subscribe to any journals or, you know, you're doing any um, CPD, which is not as good as this stuff here for Matflix, but you're doing um, stuff which has been paid for by industry, you will find you're just being advertised to every third page. And it's nice and glossy. And I saw a beautiful piece of CPD um, the other day and, and I scrolled to the bottom and you get that, how you can support mums to breastfeed. And it's an advert for a company that makes nipple shields and creams and um, breast pumps and all sorts of things. And it's not about helping to breastfeed at all. In fact, it's about why we might need their products and we don't need their products. So um, what we need is really good support. And as an IBCLC, you know, always find somebody who knows what they're talking about. That's the clue. So what they're saying is, and I'll, I'll just put these slides up very briefly. I encourage you, it's only three articles. I encourage you to go and read them yourself. It's not as big as the 2016, which was huge and amassed a load of really good evidence base. It's just three pieces this time, and they're all in the references um, about the, the way that marketing is working. So they've done some beautiful infographics here as well. Um, you can have the slides from us, so you'll be able to come back and have a look at these at your leisure as well. But you know, only one in two newborns are put to the breast in the first hour of life. That's so sad. So sad. Um, there's, it's calling on the society's collective responsibility to protect, promote and support breastfeeding, not just for breastfeeding mothers, not just for breastfeeding babies, but for all babies, because formula advertising does not serve families and babies. It serves the company. It is about making money. And that's not what we should be should be dealing with.